Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it is just so lovely to be continuing into the uh, journey of Lent deeper and deeper as we move along. Uh, and I'm trusting that light uh, for your traveling is showing up already along the way, which is our theme for the Lenten season. But um, as you enjoy that theme and explore it yourself, Simon and I just wish to say good morning. And uh, for this week of March the 20th, which is hard to believe we are so far through March, to those gathering here in the sanctuary, to those gathering from many different points across the country and continent and planet, we are just so glad you're here. And of course, along with the support of folks who are here who are greeting, folks in our tech booth, our ministry of music being offered so generously is always a wonderful gift. And uh, we have the privilege of, of gathering in this space on traditional territory of Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. And we give thanks uh, for their yeah. stewardship for uh, for many, many uh, centuries here. Absolutely. Good morning. My name is Reverend Dr. Simon Lassier. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I know last week I said I was going to try to keep this quiet for a while, <laughs> um, but I made the mistake of uh, defending my thesis in my office, and uh, there was game over from there. We all knew so, what was happening. I know. I saw little, little faces in the window. And <laughs> anyway. And, and plus, he saw it in the notes there. Phil's going to mention I know. this. <laughs> So, anyway. so thesis defended. Yeah, the, the defending was defended, and um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to all of you for your, your, your prayers. It's been a long journey, started in 2018, and um, yeah, here, here I am. Um, Megan took the kids with her to Ontario, so I've been celebrating by myself, so <laughs> it's really great. Thank you for, for, for that, uh, that, 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 warm, that warm love and all your prayerful support all these years, so yeah. Um, if you are joining online, uh, you will have met Mimi uh, if you're on Facebook, and Mimi is our host this morning. Mm -hmm. so. uh, the congregation will want to know that it has a special meeting coming up uh, a week from tomorrow. It's Monday, which is a little different. Monday, uh, on March the 28th, it's at 7 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. Uh, there is a Zoom link. Uh, been established. Many of you will have seen it already in the attachments to, to this past Friday, and we will continue to make that link uh, clear to you in coming communications. The specific purpose of that is to receive a motion that the congregation does need to vote on. Uh, specifically, that motion has to do with uh, the proposed call to the Reverend, the doc Reverend Dr. Simon <laughs> Lucior. Who am I? <laughs> this guy here uh, as, uh, as the new lead minister. And uh, so that's uh, Monday, March 28th. So yes. You won't want to miss that. Um, coming up, uh, we, as, as things continue to change with, with uh, COVID, uh, starting uh, next week after the service, uh, we will be resuming fellowship hour, fellowship time afterwards, so coffee in the gym. Um, do, I know. <laughs> um, do note, though, however, that until April 8th, we are required to check vaccination statuses at, um, at the door only for the, 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 the coffee time. Um, those are our provincial regulations, and so we will be doing that for next week and the following week. And after that, if we um, do indeed move provincially to drop uh, vaccine passports and all that stuff, um, then those won't be required, but just note that for the next two weeks. And it's, it's something, obviously, we would long, our, our stance mm -hmm. with worship has been that everyone is welcome, and of course, we would like to extend that to coffee time, um, but we also want to continue to be able to be church. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's right. We look forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. I th anything else that we might yes. be forgetting? Well, yes, I, I realized by, by, by jumping the gun with <laughs> yes. me anyway. We're, uh, we're, here we are. We're way out of order, yes. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, so, and then next week is uh, Philip's last Sunday. Um, how, how do you feel about that? Woo! Uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> 
And sometimes that comes out, <laughs> whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's just, it's hard to believe, but there are just increasing conversations and folks uh, expressing well wishes and blessings and prayers as Kim and I uh, take on the next adventure, whatever that may be. And so it, it is feeling more and more real, uh, feels right. Uh, feels good. Yeah. No. So that will be next week where we'll be uh, celebrating 40 years of ministry and um, everything. The, the 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 whole celebration, just particularly for those of you online, so so that you are aware, um, everything will will be taking place during the service itself that will be live streamed, and yeah. then afterwards we will have a coffee and cake in the gym, um, but there will be no program or reception of any kind afterwards, um, just so that those of you who are unable to make it um, don't feel like you're missing out on anything. Right. Um, you will be missing out on the fellowship. And <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, anyway, here we are. So, um, so that's next week, and we really look forward to that. I think it'll be a really special and meaningful service. Yes, I look forward to that as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, o- over the last number of weeks, I've had the great privilege of uh, taking a step back into various places that I have been in ministry, um, but this morning, uh, I, I'm, I'm stepping way, way back to where I, it all began. Mm. <laughs> When I was a child uh, and growing up, and uh, you, I grew up in southwestern Ontario, and unless you are familiar with the Ontario map, you, have, you don't realize how far south Ontario dips, way in there. So actually, Detroit and much of Michigan was north of where I was growing up. Mm. And, uh, and so uh, Windsor was the largest city of size on the Canadian side of the border, but Detroit and Chicago and Cleveland and all those places were not that far away, usually just across the lake, so a long swim or a short drive. <laughs> and uh, th- uh, so that's where I did my growing up on a, on a farm. Uh, uh, my parents chose to build their home on the corner of my paternal grandfather's farm with the promise to, to accompany them through to their last days, which mm. they did. And that was just a rich bringing up for me, um, being on the soil, uh, having wide open spaces, being in that agricultural community. My grandfather had worked the farm. I was his shadow on the farm an experience I wouldn't want to have changed for anything uh, in in the world. I I knew that when I went to grandma and grandpa's home next door, (laughs) didn't matter how I had acted up at home, (laughs) I was now perfect. (laughs) Isn't that a wonderful role for grandparents to be able to play and just affirm you are good? (laughs) And uh, I I just certainly enjoyed that. My mother and father were of, of Methodist background, United Church background, Baptist background, they decided to combine their spiritual lives in a United Church in the town of Essex, Ontario, not far out of Windsor. This is just a shot of the, the, the church building. It, it served the town, and it served a, a large agricultural region around it. That was a place that really grounded me and so with so many touchstones that have remained with me that's where i learned that church could be synonymous with community it could smack of family and caring for each other i became aware as i grew up there that that wasn't always smooth there were at times arguments within the family but family uh, hung together my mom and dad were great examples of pretty humble folk, Um, and my mother found her way volunteering. She never liked to be front and center. My dad liked it even less, and yet my mother was, ended up on the worship committee, chairing the worship committee, being UCW president, my father being the chair of the property committee, chairing their governing board, all in just offering their gifts when it was their time to, to step up. So our home was a very active home in the life of that congregation. It was a, a time in the growing up as a kid through the children's programs where churches were bulging at the seams. It's the 60s, right? Early 60s. 
Um, and which sounds great, there were always lots of people, but you could, eas could easily get lost in just the numbers, the sheer numbers. You were always a part of a large group, right. not a lot of individual attention. And so it was certain individuals and souls, adults and sometimes teenagers when I was this little, mm. who just had that ability to welcome yeah. and to know they were there for you. And so very much growing up here has impacted my vision of, of what church and church community can be everywhere. Yeah. And uh, so as I light the Christ candle uh, this morning, I am lighting it to honor uh, the lessons that I learned there, to honor the love that I learned there, to honor the grace that they shared with me enough to sponsor me when it came time into ministry. Mm -hmm. wow. And so I give great thanks yeah. for the people of Essex, <laughs> a very uh, UK sounding term, uh, which was kind of the way uh, there with the lots of little towns uh, named for places they remembered long, long ago. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, a wonderful heritage there. Thank you. And so with the, that light of Christ shining to us and to them, I invite you to share with me in the call to worship this morning. The Lord be with you and, and also, also with, with you. you. On this Lenten road, God will shine a light on a new reality. Our, Our lives, lives will, will be, be buoyed, buoyed and overflowing, overflowing love. love. On this road, we may find in faith the free gifts of God. In, In celebration, celebration, we will refresh the world with compassion. compassion. Let's pray. God, we gather today as your people. And meet with us as we meet with you offering you all of who we are. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear God, God of steadfast love, imagination of all ages, you offer to all the world where all thirst is quenched, all hungry are fed, all strangers become family. Open our eyes and ears, our hearts and spirits this morning, Lord, that we may be healed of our pain and hurts. We may be freed from our fears and anxieties and placed on pathways that lead to peace and service to you. At this time, we take a minute to silently pray for our friends and our family. We pray for Pat and Dennis for their loss and grief. We pray for Beryl and her stroke recovery. We pray for Joe and Bob and their health concerns. We pray for all those in life transitions, for Reverend Philip and Kim, and Reverend Dr. Simon and Megan, as they approach new pathways. And finally, God, please hear our prayers about wars all over this world but right now, especially in the Ukraine. God of all creation, God of the heights and the depths and everything in between. This world, a place of such wondrous creatures and abundant life. We are praying for a miracle, one of the smallest of changes that would have immense consequences. As people around the world seek to end the war that Russia has perpetrated in Ukraine, we seek to end the death. We want peace. We are praying for a change of mind, a change in heart in the Russian leadership. Help them, God of all hope, to see that this is a chance to step back from this war, to pull back the escalation, to let go of whatever it is that they chose, the path that has led to death and chaos and destruction. We need a miracle. We need a miracle that will help them not only pull back, but stop the idea of a nuclear option. We need a miracle for the rebuilding of this nation Help us to bring this to an end, God, one that will allow the sunflowers of Ukraine to reach their growth, sprouting in the soil of peace, under a hope-filled sky. Help us to make that miracle, God. And finally, Lord, help us to remember the Easter moment that it should give us some sense that the story of Jesus' death and resurrection and all that it can mean will continue. Help us to know that Jesus' call has strength and resilience. The worldwide community of Jesus' dis disciples have continued through 2,000 years of change and war. Help us to live out our discipleship and our ministry to the best of our ability. Help us to be an Easter people. Easter is an invitation to focus not on the grave, but on the risen Christ. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen.
Good morning. I'm Gwen Carpenter, and I grew up with the Bible. Actually, the Bible is a part of our family. It had its own persona. It even had a place at the table because we had this beautiful, it was like a silver-plated Bible that was larger than life when I was three years old. And it had a place of honor on the coffee room, coffee table, you know, in front of the couch. But at dinner time, it was the booster seat. And so you would bring it to the kitchen table. It followed the kitchen table, especially when we had guests. And that's where my sisters and I would fight over who got to sit on the Bible. <laughs> so it was a very important piece of, of uh, my family history. It also kept the family genealogy. So after it's got passed down, um, came to learn that there were love letters stuck in there. There was a little postcard from Germany that a great uncle had sent home. So it was also like the keeper of everything important in the family. I confess now that I still have a Bible problem. <laughs> Before I left this morning, I counted, I have 18 Bibles, honest to God, on my shelf. Here are two of them. This one was my, my grandmother's that she kept in her purse. And when she passed away, mom and I went through grandma's purse. And here was her little New Testament. And it's got like her little list of last time she took her pills. It's got, <laughs> and then there's this one that was Bill's mother's. Um, and there's nothing in it. It's very clean and tidy, just like she was. Um, it's a gorgeous little thing. But on thir So 13 of these Bibles are on one shelf, and, and they're next to the assortment of hymnals, and assortment of, there's a, one Koran, and there's the Apocrypha, and there's a Winston Churchill sayings, and there's all these other things. And then I have my five Bibles that I use all the time, because I have a pro I'm a Bible geek. There's not a time that I don't hear something from the Bible that I go, hmm, what did that mean? And so I use them, and they're piled on a shelf next to different theologians. So I confess that I really have a Bible problem. I just can't get enough of it. So when I come on Sunday mornings and I come to worship, I'm so grateful, whether I'm at home watching online or, or on vacation or whether I'm here, Part of worship and part of being a person of faith is, is the opportunity to get to read scripture and then to get to listen to our ministers and the people that know a whole lot more than I do, how to interpret those scriptures. And so I come to you this morning in prayer just being grateful for the opportunity to read scripture because I'm a geek and I'm, that's my confession. So let's pray. Holy God, Jesus said that no one can live by bread alone. I've heard it said that your word is all we need to enter the land of the living. So today we ask that your word become the light to our paths, living more fully in you. And God, I just ask you to send your life to our souls for us to follow your way. Amen. Today's passage is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, 1 through 9. At that very time, there were some, some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? Gardener replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God.
the uh, congregation which I grew up is just uh, remaining with me today. And I'm thinking of the longtime minister who was there when I was growing up. I didn't know any other minister until I think I was around the age of 19. He was there a long time. And uh, he, I, I thought he was picking on me. <laughs> and I complained to my mother. I was probably around about the age of 15, maybe. He would invited me uh, to do something yet again in the worship service. I thought it was picking on me. And I went to my mother, who was very quietly wise, and, and to complain. Mom, why is Reverend Geiger always picking on me? And there was just a bit of silence. And she said, perhaps because he believes you can. And she didn't say anything more to pursue that with me, and she just left that, left that thought to percolate in me. And uh, he was one who was a tremendous encourager uh, of me, and I had the privilege, just as the pandemic was beginning to brew, and just before everything was shut down, I had the great privilege of celebrating his life back in Ontario. And uh, we had many fine memories. I'm, I'm just aware that, though, that, that those memories and those times and those people are very much with me this morning in my heart. If you had one uh, shot to ask God um, anything you wanted to ask, anything that you wanted to ask, what would that be? Now, I've had the urge um, <clears throat> on more than one occasion, uh, again, assuming that it's a hypothetical opportunity to ask God a question, I would ask, why mosquitoes? <laughs> Maybe it's because I grew up in Ontario and spent time camping in northern Ontario where some mosquitoes could carry you away. Uh, because, I would ask that, because if, as some people have suggested, that mosquitoes are completely unnecessary, and, and that if they were removed from the food chain, it would make no difference whatsoever. Now, assuming that information that came to me is true, and if the global impact would be negligible, God, could we do that? Could we wipe them all out? Now, I suppose uh, a question that you would ask uh, if you were given one question to ask God would depend on what it is that's going on in your life uh, or what might be happening on the global stage. Um, that one question you got to ask God will depend on a number of factors. Given the chance to ask God anything, you, you wanted to ask, what, what would it be? I'm going to let you just think about that. And first, as before we continue, let's just pray. Oh, Lord, <clears throat> may I never lightly presume to speak your word, nor may we ever lightly presume to hear your word. For in your word is life, abundant life. Well, Luke tells us in today's gospel text about uh, a group of people uh, who didn't have to pretend that they were given their chance to ask a question. Uh, we come upon this crowd that is already um, gathered. Uh, apparently, a, a teacher is teaching, and this teacher has quite a bit of gravitas. Uh, they listen into what is being said. Uh, this teacher is talking about what happens to them. Uh, 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 what happens to them are, are signs of the ends of times, that they are things that could be read and predicted. And this group that has gathered realizes uh, this is their chance. And, and it's not entirely out of left field what they choose to say to Jesus, although it sounds to me left field-ish. Um, when they choose to uh, speak up about Pilate 
And this blood being spilled, being mingled of the Galileans and sacrifices, uh, it, it's because they think that uh, what Jesus is trying to say to this, this assembled group of people is that there is, is this overarching theme of life that applies to Judea, that applies to all people of first century. And this theme somehow says that there is this abundance of signs that, that tell them what is significant about their time, what they should pay attention to. And so they say, oh, well, hey, Jesus, uh, we hear you talking. Signs, we get it. It's about signs. We know what you mean. Like when all of those innocent Galileans were murdered, uh, and so they get their shot with Jesus. And, and I don't know if they were expecting some resolution to that statement or some clarity, but that's not what they got. Uh, what they got from Jesus is more questions that are, that are fired right back at them. Not unusual for Jesus to do that. And it's a question that began with, do you think... You see, I believe Jesus realizes what has been put out in front of him uh, is not actually a question. Uh, it's more like a foregone conclusion. So Jesus does some digging uh, to get to the question that is really beneath their statement. And he asks it. He says, do you think that the Galileans that you heard about uh, that died at the hands of Pilate in the middle of their worship uh, were somehow worse than everything else who is living in the Galilee? I is that why they died? And then he asked them one more question, almost for good measure, I, I imagine, because they haven't brought up anything about a tower and an accident. But Jesus says, now, do you remember those 18 people um, that died under the weight of that tower, that collapsed a while back. Remember that? Um, do you think they were just worse people than everything, everyone else in uh, Jerusalem and that's why they died? Do you think? Now, I know it's basic. I know it sounds almost like a no-brainer, something like you do not have to hear in a sermon. Um, and maybe it sounds even like I'm insulting your intelligence and mine. But are we ever past the point uh, of needing a reminder that God cares about perception? Uh, that God cares how we view the world, how we see the world, how we view the people around us, particularly perhaps the bad things happening in the world. Now, otherwise, Jesus just wouldn't have taken it on. Um, think with me for a moment, just in general terms, not necessarily in terms of what God does, uh, but how does perception get drawn out uh, and dealt with? Where do you, at, at home or uh, at school or uh, at work, uh, in your workplace, or in your downtime, wherever you find yourself, where do you begin if rearranging the furniture of the human mind, the way of thinking, is what needs doing? How, in, in life together, uh, dare I say, in church, together, uh, do we set the kind of tables where we find ourselves seeing things differently, having a, having a perception overturned, uh, challenged, taken apart, and, and we're not mad about it. At least we're not so hot about it that it shuts down the system. How do we do that? Now, if you're Jesus, you tell a story about a fig tree. You tell a story about a fig tree that's in trouble, and it's a quick story. Uh, once there was a fig tree... The landowner, the one who actually owned the land and the soil in which this tree is planted, expected the fig tree to do what fig trees do. 
have figs. And so evidently this landowner comes back and he checks and first year, no figs. Second year, no figs. Third year, right, no figs. And it's at that point that he's had it. And the owner looks at the gardener and says, show me the fruit. I'd like to see it. And the gardener knows what's coming. The landowner says, time's up. Just cut it down. And the gardener says, please, no. Give me a little bit more time. Watch me. Just watch me dig some holes around that tree. Watch me scatter some fertilizer. Come back next year. And that's it. If you are Jesus... That's how you begin to get at overturning their perceptions about how things happen, how life unfolds, how death comes about for some people. These three verses about a fruitless fig tree is supposed to do the work of upending our perceptions. And not just any perceptions, but perceptions about something um, as serious as the death of innocent people. And I'm still mad that we don't get to actually find out if that tree bears fruit. But what I'm more concerned about is a question that I cannot seem to answer for myself. Why here? Why now? I mean, what in the world does a fruitless fig tree have to do with anything? especially with what just happened in these earlier verses, these rather important events that have been brought up. <clears throat> the question that was brought before Jesus and the two questions that Jesus puts back uh, before the crowd, <laughs> figuring it out. What does the fruitless fig tree have to do with that? From what I gather, scholars and preachers, they fall into two major camps on this front. Both of them think that Jesus tells the story about the fig tree to reinforce his earlier points in these current events. The first camp says that Jesus tells the story of the fruitless fig tree because it reinforces a really clear point, and that point is that everyone needs to either repent or perish. Rather dualistic thinking. And then the second camp begins the same way. Jesus tells the story of this fruitless fig tree to prove uh, a really clear point, uh, but it is not either repent or perish. His point, says this other line of thinking, is that most of us have this thing called false reinsurance. And if you want to make the argument that this, these first couple of stories in the section that Gwen read um, is all about the need to repent, then here's how you do it. You take verses, the first five verses, you say, look here, these people died before they realized they were going to die. And with that in mind, the moral of that story is we should get it together. We may not have a whole lot of time because God has expectations. And, and this is where the fig tree comes into the picture. And the expectation is bear fruit or perish. Show me the figs or get chopped. Again, some rather harsh dualistic thinking. And, and then if you want to make that case that today's passage is not all about the, the repenting and perish or about uh, this thing called false reassurances, about the, the things that we reassure ourselves about, the things that we tell ourselves to make ourselves feel better. It's how you make that argument. This is how you make that argument. You point to the verses the story of the, the death of Galilee as people fell and, and died in this accident, and you say, really, the life is all about tragedy. And what we see in those verses are people like you and me who have a tendency to try to distance ourselves from what happens and to say, oh, that just won't happen to me. Uh, I'm safe. I have, uh, I, I'm different from those other people. I am in control. I can manage my life. 
And those people somehow put themselves in the way of, of tragedy, and that's why they died. But those perceptions just fail us. And that's where this fig tree, I think, comes in with all that convoluted thinking that is just not all that helpful. It, it, it's not enough to tell yourself <laughs> that having green leaves is plenty alive, that it's plenty good for God. And let me just pause and say two things, which is that if you have even gotten this far, if you've ever gotten to the point where you're asking, willing to ask a question like, why does Jesus tell the stories that he tells when he tells them? You've done good work. Uh, that's called showing up to the text. Because, I mean, what can God do with us if we don't show up? If we don't let a light come on, let a light be shined. And secondly, engaging the interpretations that others offer us, the thinking of different groups, <clears throat> different camps, what others have studied and labored and put out there and engaging those and not just engaging them, but going into them generously and deeply, it's also commendable. And this is Lent and we, it's a time that we are encouraged to explore and sit with the word and uh, to have time in conversation with, uh, with a brother or a sister and to break open one of those 18 Bibles that Gwen has on her shelves. And, 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 and the insights that they've gleaned from the Word, it's all a good thing. But, but you know, here's my confession. You can imagine those camps of interpretation of this text, trying to figure out what it is that's going on, what are the lessons we're to take from them, and I find myself just wandering away from both of them, which have uh, the perception of finding uh, life uh, is about repenting, I can't go for it, that life is about bearing fruit when you're expected to bear fruit, and there's a timeline for that to happen that's mapped out. I can't sink my teeth into that. And it's not because I think that I'm smarter or more sophisticated or somehow better at the Bible, because I'm not. I find myself wandering from the opinion of those groups gathered with Jesus, trying to make sense of why it is that things happen. And I'm wandering from those camps because I realize that I am being wooed I'm being wooed by the gardener. Since I'm already confessing, here's what I really think. Y'all can have those stories about the deaths taking place early in what Gwen shared with us. You can take them all into another room and hash it out. Are they historically accurate? Did a tower really fall and people were killed? Did Pilate really do this dastardly deed uh, with some Galileans while they were worshiping and offering sacrifices to God? You can have it all. But what I realize what I need in this is the gardener. Every time. I need the gardener in the story. You see, because... Here's what's happening when the gardener comes into my view. When I get to that verse 6, when Jesus starts the story about the fig tree, when I get to there, I, you see, I've already started to perk up a little because I like the Jesus who dares to say no, not at all. When you and I get to thinking that some people deserve uh, a, a result or to die more than we do, I like that Jesus that pushes back at that notion. I start to move a little, but here's when I really wake up. It's when, uh, here's where that fire that Jeremiah describes is deep in the bones, begins to flare in me, when the gardener comes on the scene. Because where does it all begin? I mean, where does our story, our heritage story over millennia begin but in a garden? And I know that somebody has told you along the way that that garden story, the Eden story, um, goes bad, that it doesn't work out well for us. But I beg to differ. 
Because what happens right after that garden is we are given the land to till and to care. How does God, and I'm fast forwarding quite a bit here, how, does, how is it that God tells us as that story unfolds that God cares for our well-being by God being the vine and you and I are the branches and sometimes it happens by pruning. Sounds a lot like stuff that goes on in a garden. And in what way does God bring about this business we call the new creation that shows up in New Testament writing by the, by the reckless distribution of seeds? Remember that reckless kind of tossing of seeds, sowing them anywhere here and there, knowing that some will take well to the soil? It's Gardening that begins to stir me. Where was it that Jesus felt the agony of a rejection? It was in a garden. For whom did Mary Magdalene, according to John's story, mistake a risen Lord? Well, she mistook him for a gardener. And it took place in a garden. Um, what will it, all, all of this world, all of this wondrous life, what will it look like, according to promises in the book of Revelation, when God gets things right, when the kingdom unfolds in its completeness, and when we are on board with what God's desires are, it's nothing short of a garden, a garden of eternity. And that just sounds to me like such good news. And more importantly, that's the good news that I didn't get to on my own. I, I didn't get to that good word because I actually got that chance to ask God or Jesus that one question I have. No. I, I, and I didn't get to that good news somehow because of the question of those that got to ask. Uh, it wasn't that that made it, it gave it perfect sense for me. I got to that good and saving word by what I would now think of as that disruptive grace of God, the disruptive grace of God. I got to that word by allowing a certain gardener to patiently dig into my roots, to nourish me, uh, to tend me, to, to prune me. And somehow this morning, that Reverend Geiger, whose life I celebrated a couple of years ago, was a gardener. He's just showing up for me in that story as I continue to reflect on it, knowing that life was not about dualistic thinking. Our view of the world is open, and that there is this this gardener willing, if we're up for it, if we're open to it, to tend to us, to nourish us, to be the one that steps in to say, no, this, I give me time, I am still working with this one. I will be the holy disruptor. I will be the Jesus you ask me to be. I will be the one to say no. There's no chopping down. There's no required repentance. There is no required fruit at a particular time. It's about letting me dig and dig and tend the soil and let you respond and let you grow and let you come to your own ahas and to let the light shine on you, to let the rain fall on you, and to be nourished by all of that that I, the gardener, give to you. Hmm. I was surprised to find in this story some, uh, a holy disruptor, Jesus. But that's how I'm thinking of him this morning. That disruption, to, no, don't cut it down. Let my work continue. And so I simply close by saying, long may he wreak havoc with our perceptions, with the things that need turning over in our lives, the questions that have not yet become clear for us, the little niggling and the wrestling 
that is there deep inside. This Lent, may we let a light shine on our curiosity and our questions and, and find you and me even more open soil, open to the tilling of that good and grace-filled gardener. Amen. Philip, um, it struck me as you were speaking that we live in a, a time where um, you can get a self-help book on, on, on anything. And as you were speaking, what, what really struck me was this image of the tree and the call is not for us to fertilize our own roots, as the call is not for us to prune ourselves. And that's, I think, the beauty of um, this faith of ours, is that we trust that that's the, the work that God does. Hey, absolutely. I, I, I think of a, of a mom and dad who were around, their, they were in their late 50s, and they were watching their adult son, a gifted teacher, um, slowly pass away due to a diagnosis with cancer. And they were searching for what it was they had done 
or what he had done that caused him to be going through this. They thought of, you know, motorcycling uh, uh, accident when he was a teen. Did this, was this the root of it? They're looking for that that reason, that answer. And what, we, what I could begin to see in the young man as he was in hospital bed, that that's not where he was. He was giving himself access to this gardener who was doing this work in him, who brought him to such an amazing place of calm and grace in what was happening to his young body, that he was then the one to bring peace Mm. and calm to his own mom and dad in that situation and to the point that they were able to then relinquish. Uh, The the searching for the why, the how did this happen, it must have been for this or that. They let it melt away and just let Mm. the gardener really tend to them through him. It it was amazing to be part of that holy ground. Yeah, no, and so if you're here today or, or at home and you're finding yourself putting a lot of energy into your own self-pruning, your own self-fertilizing, um, let go and remember there is a God in whose hands we can rest and, and trust. And um, as things uh, slowly continue to open up, um, we know that the hallways on throughout the throughout the week are are are, are starting to fill up with laughter. Um, I I popped in during the service to go see our Sunday club kids who will be um, I think on Easter will be coming back into the service with us. I know I've missed their presence. The youth group has been meeting. The Stephen uh, Stephen ministers and Stephen leaders have been continuing the good work of caring for those who are hurting. And um, if you would like to help make all of this work possible, um, there are offering plates uh, located by the exits, and you can also give online or uh, by text, and the information is all on your screens. Uh, so before Philip offers a closing blessing, let's, um, let's pray for the offering. God... We give you thanks for all the ways in which you bless us, and we know that part of worship is giving back that which we have been given. And so, God, you call all, each one of us to do that in different ways, and um, God, we just ask that you would receive the fruit of our labor and that you would multiply it for your goodness throughout this community. We ask all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And friends... There are many conundrums that come into our lives, and we try and sort it out and figure it out all on our own. But the gardener invites us to let those notions, to let those perceptions, to let those uh, overarching themes just be subject to this gardener that digs. Give access to your heart and to the roots of you so that this new growth is possible. And as the light shines on that good work, may you go from here to live your life out into the world that God loves. And as you do that, may you see the face of Christ on the people you meet. May the people you meet see the face of Christ shining in you and through you. Amen. Amen.